So today I'm going to drink a little tea and talk about the movie Hidden Figures and maybe a little bit about reparations. This is a word. This is a word. This is a word. Hey y'all, welcome to another food for thought. This is going to be a little bit of a chai and chat. Uh, which is, I think, my new name for when I just sit here. I'm gonna drink a little tea today. I'm having this new me rooibos tea, which I had the other day. I think rooibos is like my favorite tea. It's just I don't know. It's something about it. It's just so rich and delicious. And if I'm not having coffee, although I'm not gonna say that I'm not drinking any coffee, but when I'm not, generally speaking, having coffee, there's nothing like this robust tea to just make me feel like all warm and gooey and wonderful. So a couple of things I want to talk about today. So I watched the film Hidden Figures last night and I found myself getting real like, you know, getting my shoulders all up like this. So the film, if you don't know it, it's the story of, um, let me get the names right. It's uh, the story of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, who were three African-American women who were working in the NASA space program in the 60s and without their contributions, their, we, John, I mean, uh, uh, what is it, um, Glenn, wouldn't, I think it's John Glenn, would not have gone into space. Just would not, wouldn't, would not have done the, you know, triple um, uh, orbit around the planet. Um, and it was not just, you know, they were, it wasn't just because they were bringing the coffee, right? We're talking about, um, especially Catherine, um, Catherine Johnson did the, you know, really complicated calculations that were needed for them to figure out exactly when re-entry was going to happen and based on these angles. I was really blown away by how much of a role and how much of a contribution these particular um, women made. And Dorothy Vaughn was the person who actually figured out they got their first, you know, they brought in IBM machines because they couldn't do the calculations fast enough to figure things out. And Dorothy Vaughn actually figured out how to use those machines and trained a whole, um, basically a whole troop of uh, African-American women in how to do the programming. And another thing that's really interesting is that um, I think a lot of people don't know that back in the early days of programming, programming was considered women's work because it was kind of like word processing. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So just something that you, you know, something to go and like, you know, look it up yourself. I don't know. But um, I thought the film was really um, amazing. There were great performances by uh, Taraji P. Henson, Octavia Spencer, Janelle Monet, the, the singer Janelle Monet was wonderful in the film. Um, Kevin Costner's in the film. Um, who else? Kirsten Dunst is in the film. And like Kirsten Dunst, I was like, whoa, is looking like kind of not matronly, but it was just really cool to see Kirst Kirsten Dunst not playing a little girl. Like I remember Kirsten Dunst in Interview of the Vampire playing like the little, you know, the little doll vampire. So, um, you know, just looking at that film and thinking about the dominant narrative that you hear about the contributions of African Americans, obviously, I think on some level, everyone understands that, yeah, black people were in there, like, making it happen too, right? Black people have always been in there helping to make the world the world, right? For good, for better or worse, right? We understand that. But when you dig into the details and you realize whose faces have simply been erased, just simply been erased, how did I not know about this math genius Katherine Johnson, and, and you know, we talk about the fact that, you know, women aren't good at math, and they're like, you know, this was a math genius who was a woman who was an African American who was working at NASA with the most brilliant mathematical minds in the world, and of them was head and shoulders above the rest. So I don't know, you know, maybe some of that was for the film, but I think it is a, I think it's a really important film and really important to watch. However, while I was watching it, some things came up for me. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of conversations about, you know, 
you know, PewDiePie being racist and Foot Soldier making his ridiculous videos and I did a spoof of Foot Soldier and I realized when I talk about Foot Soldier I don't tell people who he is and you'll have to forgive me if you're coming to this channel and you don't know about folks like PewDiePie. PewDiePie is a YouTube content creator with 57 million subscribers, a really huge uh, YouTube content creator. Not necessarily vegan, but one who has, I think, a huge following and therefore a huge impact on a lot of people who use the platform. And uh, PewDiePie recently was, you know, used, you know, the word nigger in, uh, you know, in, a, in something that was streaming live and got a lot of pushback from it. And, you know, some of you in my last video where I talked about it assumed that I was saying that PewDiePie was not racist. And let me be clear, I don't know if PewDiePie is racist, and I suspect that PewDiePie has a lot of internalized racist ideas. I really believe that. For him to use the word in the way that he used it, that's not, you know, that's not casual, right? That's not casual. Um, and it's something that, you know, PewDiePie needs to check. Now, not to say that, um, you know, while I'm on the subject of that, like, I don't want people to think that I don't understand that I have a lot of, you know, racial bias, right? And not all of it is like anti-white. I think the assumption is if you're black, you're anti-white, and if you're white, you're anti-black. You can be white and you can be anti-white. And you can be black and you can be anti-black, right? So to think that every black person who is, you know, you know, struggling with racism is trying not to like kill white people. It's just ridiculous. That's like centering whiteness too much in the world, right? Sometimes it's not about, it's not about white people at all. But you know, that to say, you know, I accept the fact that I have racial biases, right? And sometimes I get very uncomfortable when people of certain races walk into the room because of things that are programmed, right? Things that I see in the media, right? And those images come up to me when I see that person and I'm like, wow, that looks like the character from that film who did all that, those nasty, horrible things, right? These, associ these associations get made. These associations get these associations get made and we can't just pretend that they're not there. But um, I found myself, you know, thinking about as I watched the film and there's so many scenes where there are just blatant where, you know, the people who are being identified or identifying as white in the scene see that their own progress is being held back by their racist ideology, right? There are scenes where Taraji P. Henson as, as, as Katherine Johnson is running back and forth across this campus at, Nans at Nassau, right? 40 minutes it takes for, for, for her to go to the restroom, the only colored a uh, women's restroom on the campus. She has to run, you know, 20 minutes to go there and do her business and then run back, sometimes through the rain, and it's taking valuable time out of her doing these, you know, intricate cal calculations, right? In the time that she was running across the campus, she could have, like, you know, solved the issues and we might have, you know, beat the Russians to space, whatever that means, right? Which is another thing that I want to talk about. Um, maybe another video, but um, the fact that the racism of the white people in that situation prevented them from doing what they wanted to do. And this is what is so screwed up about racism. It's not like any of them, I would, none of them would likely identify as a racist, right? They were just, there was a colored bathroom and that's the bathroom she was supposed to use. But no one stood up and said, hey, this is messed up. She's going across the all the way across the quad to use the restroom. We need a we at least need a, a colored restroom on this side so that you know she can use the restroom. What ends up happening is I don't want to give up too too much about the movie. And yes, it was dealt with, but it's that understanding of the way racism worked. It wasn't that any of those people they probably liked Katherine Johnson. They probably thought Katherine Johnson was amazing when she was doing that work that was benefiting all of them. But it never occurred to any of them that it would have been convenient. It would have made her life easier 
if she didn't have to, if she wasn't limited to the use of the colored restroom. And I think that's why when we have these conversations about like who used the, who used the word nigger and we think that that's going to solve racism, when the truth of the matter is, it's like, where are the spaces uh, in our society where we see people of color or women or uh, people who are um, differently abled or whatever it is that that person is dealing with that might make it more difficult for them to be the most productive member of society that they can be. Because that's ultimately we, what we, we don't want to stop anyone from being able to contribute to society. But what we end up doing is we shoot ourselves in the foot because we're making it more difficult for some people to be productive members of society. And then we turn around and say, well, they're not productive members of society. That's a problem with them. Let's just shut them out altogether. And still, it doesn't solve the problem. Because then you have a math genius like Katherine Johnson who can't can't help get John Glenn into space, right? Ha can't help get John Glenn into space. And it goes on, you know, there's a whole thing where, you know, Katherine Johnson isn't allowed to sit in on the briefings, where if she had been in the briefings, she would have been able to do these calculations in real time, right? And help them figure it out. But they won't let either a woman or a person of color into those briefings because it's just never been done before. And that, uh, that happens again and again, you know, expectations, um, based on the way things are now and the way, you know, what's wrong with them? We don't need to change that. That's not, that's not, but it's hurting everybody. It's not just hurting the person who's being marginalized. It's hurting all of society because we have people who then kind of become a burden on the system because we haven't allowed them to become the best person that they can be. And I think most plainly it happens in African-American communities but around education because you have these huge um, African-American populations in the inner cities who don't have access to decent education. They don't have access to decent education. They don't have access to the resources that they need. They don't have um, access to the teacher's hands are tied. The teachers can't teach in the, in the classroom because they're busy teaching to the test. And then there aren't the resources that the students need, like access to computers or access to, you know, updated books or having a safe environment to go to school in, overcrowded classrooms. All of these things add up to African Americans not having access to a good education. And that is a huge barrier to entry in our society. But we don't see that as a problem because, you know, well, they're broken anyway. They're criminals anyway. All the things that we say to ourselves to make it okay to not provide a decent education. Which is what brings me to this um, topic of, you know, reparations. Which, when I say the word reparations, I'm sure that there's a whole bunch of people who can tune out. So let's just let all the people who are, you know, who don't want to have a conversation about reparations go ahead and leave the room room and turn off the video. Give you time. Go, go, go. All right. Now, those of you who are, you know, reasonable adults and want to have a conversation, um, the idea of reparations being something that is for black people is what I think stops us from having the conversation in a meaningful way. Reparations should not be about black people. Reparations should be about making sure every individual in our society is equipped to be the most productive contributor to the society. And if the society, we want to think about it as the United States, or if we want to think about it as the world, we should be bending over backwards to make sure everyone who potentially could be the genius that finally helps us resolve some of the, the problems that we have in our, in our society with our world, global warming, with all these other things, the, everyone should get the opportunity to be the best possible version of themselves that we can be. And in that developmental uh, stage from the time that they are born until the time they decide what it is that they want to do with life, people should have without barrier, without barrier, access to the tools that they need to become the best possible citizen of the world that they can. Right. So that to me is the conversation that we should be having about reparations, not about a dollar amount that will somehow 
equal the amount that was made on the backs of slaves. No, it doesn't even, no, it doesn't, I mean, you know, if you think about that, that's a reason for considering it, right? That's a reason for considering it. But it doesn't even matter. It doesn't have to have anything to do with slavery. It doesn't have to do, it shouldn't have anything to do with race. It should just have to do with making sure every single human being is equipped with what they need to be the best possible citizen that they could be. It's as simple as that, as that. And so when we talk about reparations, let's talk about it in those, in those, um, in that light, right? And then the other thing that I, that I feel torn about is this whole need. Why do we need to talk about race? Why do we need to talk about sexism? sexism? Why do we need to talk about homophobia? I feel that there are certain members of society who have been dealing with the trauma of these institutions for so long that I think part of reparation should be the emotionally and mental healing of anyone who has been targeted based on their identity. Now that might sound stupid because there are people who have like mental issues and this and that, but there is something very specific to have had the psychological damage. It's like, you know, being, uh, being held hostage at gunpoint, right? You expect that, that person is going to have to go through some type of counseling, some type of therapy to get over that trauma. And you have individuals based on gender and i'm sorry but i think that women like have throughout history gone through some of the most horrendous vi and violent campaigns in the world that are never even talked about right what happened in europe with the burning of women who did not obey who did not take on the role that society was asking them to take on to move from an agrarian society into the industrial society that we've become or more of the industrious the industrial society that we're st that we've based a lot of our society on today i think we've moved past industrial society in some ways and are still um acting like that's what we're in right so we still have this kind of like very um you know, this uh, production line mentality about people, about things, about everything, right? You know, animals are, you know, things to be thrown on a conveyor belt and then, you know, chopped into bits. You know, these are, uh, and, and forgive me if that's, um, if that's a, a triggering image for anyone, but, you know, that's the reality. Privileged Vegan made a really interesting video um, about a month ago, which I finally saw just a couple of days ago, talking about the fact that we have all become commodities. We've all become commodities, and our worth is and not necessarily arbitrary, but we move through life trying to value ourselves. And we're not given any inherent value necessarily as human beings. We talk it as a game, but we don't see that happening. So thinking about ways that we can move away from looking at people as simple commodities and think about ways that we can give people the tools that they need to become productive members of society, not for the sake of how much we can make off of them, you know, as part of this capitalist model, but we know that we just need everyone to be their best. We need everyone to be their best. Right now, especially, right? So how do we get to that? Mm. So what are some other things? Some good news, Bernie, um, Bernie Sanders introduced a bill for a national health care package, basically universal health care. And um, looking at the United States is probably the last of, uh, you know, leading nations, at least in terms of the economy. Right. So I, I don't know as far as anything else. I don't know how how advanced we can consider American society. We have a lot of stuff, sure, but I don't know how advanced we are, especially since a lot of the stuff that we have is useless stuff that's just destroying the planet. But that's a whole other story. Right. But um, uh, the United States being one of the last countries to offer um, their citizens health care, just health care as a human right, as a basic right of the citizenry of a of a of a nation to have access to health care, which is, again, this part of this uh, idea that everyone should just be the best possible person that they can be in order to be able to contribute to the society. And this moves on to another topic. So we've been talking about, like, you know, what's important. And I haven't really mentioned health care at all. 
But I feel like we've been, you know, there have been all of these divisive issues that have been coming up. Immigration, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't have conversations about immigration. But we're not going to agree as a country on immigration. We're not going to agree as a country on race relations, right? And what to do about race relations, right? Not saying that we should put them on the back burner, but I think as far as things that we can come together around, I don't imagine that there's anyone who doesn't understand the importance of having healthcare provided to every citizen of the country. If people are sick and they can't get access to healthcare, then they simply become a burden or on the system, or we're just relegating them to their death, right? We're just saying that that person doesn't count and they should go, go ahead and die. And we still have to figure out what to do with the body. So there are costs involved regardless, or we're warehousing them in, 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 you know, in wherever we're warehousing sick people who can't afford health care, right? So, um, you know, they're living on the street or what have you. So whatever it is, making sure that every member of the society is produ as productive as possible and universal health care in the United States seems Seems like something that we should all be willing to stand behind, don't you think? Don't you think? And as vegans especially, here's why. Because if the government is providing health care, right, suddenly we don't want, you know, there's not the, the you know, the profit margin doesn't is stops being a consideration. And one of the reasons that we won't talk about, you know, veganism or, you know, look at what the health, one of the reasons hospitals want us sick is because of that profit margin. But if we can do something about that profit margin and make sure that everyone is, all the hospitals are taken care of, the government is making sure that they're subsidized in whatever way they need to be subsidized. So they're not worried about just keeping their doors open or there's not like one individual in charge who's just trying to like, you know, extract wealth from everyone. Then the conversation about what we put in our bodies can finally open up, right? We don't have to be fighting with the healthcare system to, to maintain this silence about the fact that what people are putting in their bodies is making them sick. I don't know, that's just something that I was thinking about, but I thought that was a really, really great, uh, a really, really great thing. Um, also, another thing that I'm really, um, you know, a little bit upset about is what's been happening with, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, you know, I don't know enough about it to say, you know, which side is wrong and which side is right. But I don't think that anyone should simply be displaced just because the, the you know, the country that's doing the displacing displacing happens to have the power and happens to have the backing of the United States. That to me feels very, very wrong. And I'd love to know um, if there are uh, resources available for people who want to learn more about what's happening there. Or if there are others of you who've been following this, this might be something to talk about in the next live stream. Live stream. Live stream. Ah! live stream that was a, a lame scream anyway the the next um live stream which will be this sunday um at 11 a.m eastern standard time wow i feel like that is <laughs> plenty so i'm gonna go ahead and have my day and catch up with my animal and finish some laundry and other things like that um but um yeah so that's it for this video like it if you like it share Comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself. The world is a ghetto, big guns and dicky guys.